So now, I think we can start. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Yao. So Yao's been with us for a few years now. Um, Yao's been co-advised by uh, me and Marky and myself. And um, so you can look at that in a number of ways. Uh, she, she has two advisors, um, but she almost got sort of two projects at the same time. So um, she basically has been sort of straddling uh, data that's collected in, um, in my lab, um, mostly sort of spectroscopy and imaging data on the skin, um, and then applying analysis algorithms, machine learning type things, statistical algorithms um, to analyze that data. So um, she's done a really nice job sort of combining these two things, and I will let her tell you all about it, and let's welcome you now for your participation with us. about your research? I was asked for many times when I introduced myself as a PhD student. Whenever I introduced my research, everyone says, cool. I think my research is really cool because our lab uses light for skin cancer diagnosis. Welcome to my protection defense. Thank you all for coming today. My name is Yao Zhang, a PhD candidate in Biomedical Engineering at UT. My dissertation is about computational models for skin cancer diagnosis based on optical spectroscopy and imaging. First, I will give thanks to all the committee members, Dr. Tama and Dr. Maki, thank you for being my advisors. Dr. Richardbrook, Dr. Dam, and Dr. Ye, thank you all for your help along the way. This is the outline of my presentation. I will begin with the clinical motivation for my research, where three skin cancer diagnosis related problems will be identified. Then, I will provide a brief introduction of optical spectroscopy and imaging, and the need for computational models to analyze them. Next, for each problem, I will talk about my own work and the solutions. I will end with a summary of my contributions and acknowledgments. Let's begin with why do we care about skin cancer? Skin cancer is the most common cancer in the US. Non melanoma skin cancer includes basal cell carcinoma and sperm cell carcinoma, BCC and SCC. One in five Americans will develop non melanoma skin cancer by the age of 70. The annual cost for non melanoma skin, skin cancer treatment is about 4.8 billion. Melanoma is the deadliest form, even though it accounts only 1% of the skin cancer cases. More than 100,000 new cases and 6,800 deaths of melanoma are expected in the US in 2020. The annual cost for melanoma treatment is about 3.3 billion. Early detection is one method to save time and the cost. Current skin cancer diagnosis depends on biopsies. Imagine that you have a red mole on your skin and you worry about it. You go to see the dermatologist and they will visually check your mole for you first and then they send you for a biopsy. Biopsies are invasive. Time consuming. It may take up to one week to get the histology results back. And expensive. The average cost for biopsy is about $200. What? That sounds painful and scary, right? What's worse? Most biopsies turn out to be benign, which means they did not need to be removed. So, this is the first clinical challenge, the unneeded biopsy of negative uh, pigment lesions. This slide shows some examples of pigment lesions that are commonly biopsied. Of course, melanoma has to be biopsied because it's cancer. But for non-malignant pigment lesions, such as a typical or dysplastic newer or benign newer, they did not need to be removed. So the biopsies on this benign pigment 
conditions are unneeded. The biopsy rate is to evaluate the number of unneeded biopsies, which is the number of biopsies to detect one melanoma. That was reported to be from 7 to 31. Ideally, we only want one biopsy for one melanoma. 7 to 31 means there are many unneeded biopsies for the benign lesions, and we want to reduce this number. The second clinical challenge is the tumor margin assessment. After the skin cancer is confirmed, the standard of care of skin cancer treatment is the excision of the tumor. To ensure removal of the entire tumor, usually during the surgery, a large border of the health tissue is removed as well. The removed tissue is processed for histopathology if the edge are positive. Another surgery is needed to remove the cancerous tissue that had been missed in the first surgery. In the first surgery. So we want to provide an automatic tool for the tumor margin assessment before the surgery and the, at the time of the removal. So we can remove less calcium tissue in the first surgery and also decrease the need for repeat surgeries. The third clinical challenge is the intrapatient assessment for melanoma screening. For melanoma screening, there's a well-known ABCDE rule. So one more is more likely to be melanoma if A is asymmetric, B the border is irregular or is uneven, C the color has partially dark black or it has multiple colors. D, the diameter is more than 6 millimeters, and E, involving the more changes over time in terms of size, color, shape. So these are the general rules the methodologists use for melanoma screening. An interesting finding is that the methodologists use ugly duckling idea as well. What does this mean? So if one more looks different from other moths on the same patient in terms of color, shape, and size. That moth is called ugly duckling and has higher chance of being melanoma. Studies show that with the use of ugly duckling idea, the accuracy of melanoma screening can be improved. However, no current device or studies implemented this, and it's very challenging to complete the comprehensive interpatient assessment during the appointment with the doctors. So most people have multiple moths. For example, if one patient has 20 or 30 or even 50 moths, it's very hard for the doctors to finish the comprehensive interpatient assessment to find the ugly duckling lesions during melanoma screening. So we hope to provide a tool to help with this assessment. To recap, so far we have identified three clinical needs. One is to reduce the unnecessary biopsies for melanoma diagnosis. Two is to quickly assess the tumor margins during the surgery. Three is to effectively conduct interpatient assessment for melanoma screening. So we use optical technology to help with these problems. There are many existing optical technologies, and here are the three I use in my research. Diffuse reflectors spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, and imaging. So I will introduce them in my solution to each problem in more details. The optical data provides much information, much biochemical and the morphological information of the measured tissue. But because of the high dimension of the optical data, both spatially and spectrally, it's, it's not easy to interpret this information intuitively. So we need computational models to simplify and analyze this optical data. So I will talk about the detailed uh, computational models in my solution to each problem. Here I'm providing a general brief introduction.
spectrum of computational models. Basically, there are two big categories. One is statistical model. For example, we can use principal component analysis to reduce dimension for output data. With the principal components, we could build classifiers or regression models on using virtual regression, random forest, simple development machine, or neural network. So these uh, uh, statistical models have the advantage of being automatic. Future engineering is not needed, which takes time and effort. But usually, large data sets are required to achieve high accuracy. And they don't offer enough interpretability. They work as black box, and we, we don't know exactly how it works inside. The other category of conventional model is physiological or future engineering based models. So intuitively, intuitively, they can provide more interpretability, and the physicians prefer them because they, understand, they can understand better about the tissue status. So I will develop both statistical and the physiological models to solve the identified problems. After introducing the problems and the general technology and models, here are my three education goals. One, using Raman spectroscopy to reduce the number of unnecessary biopsies or benign lesions. Two, use reflectors physiological model for non-melanoma skin cancer tumor margin assessment. Three, use image feature engineering based model for assessing the similarity of moles. Let's focus on problem one first. Since I use Raman, let me briefly introduce it. So this is an example of Raman spectrum. X axis is the Raman shift or width number. Y axis is the intensity. The, the peaks in the Raman spectrum relate to specific biomolecular bonds. In skin tissue, active Raman molecular um, include collagen, lipids, and others. So different biomolecular bonds will be related to the peaks in the Raman spectrum. This is the basis why we use Raman to classify different types of skin lesions. Previous studies show the promise of using Raman for classifying melanoma and pigment lesions. So we use the error on the LC curve, sensitivity and specificity to evaluate the classification accuracy. For error on the LC curve, let me call it AULC. One means perfect. Higher than 0.5 is better than random guess. So higher than 0.5 is promising. For sensitivity, it's the true positive rate, which means predicting melanoma correctly. Higher is better, 100% is perfect. Sensitivity is the true, post, uh, true negative rate, which means predicting the benign pigment lesions correctly. Higher is better, 100% is perfect. So with the reported results from these studies, the studies achieved high and like, promising classification results using Raman for classifying melanoma and pigment lesions. The two, the, this first two are using the in vivo Raman, and, it, and their study were done in the cancer center. For the third one, they used the ex vivo Raman spectrum um, to prove that they could reduce the biopsy rate from 7 to 3.7. That's a um, great news because they can reduce the unnecessary biopsies there. Um, but no previous, no previous study used in vivo Raman study to show the biopsy rate could be reduced in skin cancer screening setting. So we want to prove that, prove that we can do that. So we collected a clinical, uh, we did a clinical study in general dermatology office. This location is important because this is where our instrument will be used in the future, and it's for skin screening setting. The left figure shows the probe we used to collect relevant data. 
the right shows the whole system in the exam in uh, the exam room in the clinic. So here are the clinical data summary. So we collected 60 lesions from 57 patients. So you see there are many unneeded biopsies on the pigmented lesions out of the total 60 lesions. And the biopsy rate here is 60 over 7, which is 8.6. Then we want to reduce the biopsy rate. We want to reduce the number of biopsies on the benign pigment lesions. How? This is my data analysis pipeline with the would be 29 over 7. So we can reduce the bath rate from 8.6 to 4.1 and that's a very promising result. Let's, ask, let's estimate the financial impact. Recall that there are more than 100,000 new cases of melanoma in the US in 2020. And the reported bath rate was to be 7 to 31, and the average cost for biopsy is about $200. So if we can save the cost, um, like we can save the 58% of them, every year, using our spectroscopy, we could save hundred millions of dollars for, for the uh, biopsies on unneeded patients. Then what's more, our optical technology is non-invasive and fast. We can predict the results immediately, no waiting. So to, to conclude for problem one, using RANA enables reducing the unnecessary biopsies. Before, for one melanoma detection, there are many unnecessary biopsies. If using our RANA spectroscopy with my model, we were able to re re reduce the biopsy a lot. Most of the biopsies on the benign device will be waived. Let's move to problem two. So I have two parts for problem two. One is to show my theoretical model works for clinical data analysis. And the next step is to apply it for tumor margin assessment. Since I'm using diffuse reflectance spectroscopy, let's see how it works. With the light source, using a fiber probe, you can shine light on the tissue. The light undergoes scattering and absorption in the tissue. The return of the light is called diffuse reflectance. Through a spectrometer, we can get the diffuse reflectance spectrum. Let's call it DIS from now on. So this depends on the scattering and absorption of the tissue. From that, we can analyze the tissue's microarchitecture, hemoglobin, melanin, and oxygen saturation of the tissue. Previous studies show the promise of using DRX for non melanoma diagnosis. For classification tasks relevant to non melanoma skin cancers, studies achieved promising sensitivity and specificity. In 2010, our group used our experimental drug table to analyze the RS. And the, um, one group and our group both used statistical models to analyze the DRS. As I mentioned earlier, physicians prefer physiological models because they can understand better about the patient's tissue status and make better decisions in terms of treatment and assess the response of patients. So we want to develop a computational physiological model to analyze PIS. This is how our Monte Carlo lookup table model works. Uh, let me talk about the forward model first. With the parameters, we can calculate the scattering and the absorption coefficients. Using a light transport model, we can model the reflectance. A popular light transport model is based on Monte Carlo simulations. Monte Carlo simulations are slow. We have the idea of saving the simulation results in a lookup table. So while modeling the reflectance with 
does gathering and absorption is faster. So with the forward model, you are able to model a spectrum given the parameters. But our real problem is to extract parameters from a measurement. So we need an inverse model. So our inverse model is basically a nonlinear optimization problem. With a measured spectrum, we will use our forward model to model a spectrum with some initial guess. So we compare the model spectrum with the measured spectrum and then calculate the error between the model spectrum and the measurement. The error will serve as the cost function for the optimization. We will update the parameters to minimize the error between the model and measured spectrum. Once the error is minimized, the parameters are extracted. So we applied a model on this data set we collected in 2014. Um, this data set includes BCC and SCC and uh, AK, which is a precancerous tissue, uh, which is a precancerous tissue type. So while well, I applied my model to this data set, this is how a typical DRS medical lookup table model fit looks like. The left figure shows the fitting process. The right figure shows the parameter updating. So the error, when the error between the measured DRS and the model fit is minimized, the parameters are about to converge and the parameters can be extracted from the measured DRS. So after extracting, after extracting the parameters, I want to see whether the parameters can achieve as good classification results as our previous statistical model did. So I compared the classification results between my physiological model versus our previously published statistical model. So I'm comparing the RC curves for two classification tasks here. So, the, so visually, my physiological model uh, is comparable to the statistical model. I also did statistical analysis Using an equivalence test, the high period tells us we fail to reject they are equal. So they are comparable. Also, I calculated the 95% confidence interval for the difference in the area and RC curve. The interval containing zero means the two models are comparable in terms of the classification performance. So if their performance is Comparable, we prefer physiological models because they offer more interpretability. For example, in this table, we know that for, for these two classification tasks, scattering coefficient, oxygen saturation, and blood volume, uh, and the uh, vessel radius are contributing to the classification tasks. Let's look at the extracted parameters from the data set. So the scattering coefficient contributes the most to the classification tasks. We can see BC, all BCC, SCC, AK lesion showed sig significantly lower scattering than their corresponding normal. This can be explained by two phenomena. So collagen is one main scattering source in skin. During the tumor development, collagen breaks down, which makes the scattering lower. And the second reason is that the epidermis thickness increases during the tumor development, which makes the sample of collagen less and thus lower the scattering. For oxygen saturation, SCC, uh, BCC shows the lower oxygen saturation because cancer cell consumes more oxygen than normal cell. SCC shows the similar trend. For vessel radius, SCC shows significantly higher vessel radius than normal, which can be explained by angiogenesis. During tumor development, the blood vessel grows more than the normal 
uh, tissue. This is it has the similar trend. So we can say that the extractor parameters were consistent with the uh, now tumor development pathology. So, so far we can claim that my model was able to extract physiological parameters that are relevant to skin cancer diagnosis and achieve similar results as our statistical model did. How about applying it for tumor margin assessment? So with two independent data sets, I want to test my models for tumor margin assessment. So I, I'm classifying BCC versus normal and SCC versus normal. This will serve as the first study to show the promise of using TRS for tumor module assessment. This is how my data analysis was done. So I trained the models using the training data set. The models include the normalization, the methodical table to extract parameters, the parameter selection, the logical regression. With the trained models, I, used to, I applied the same models on the testing data set and the RC curve is to evaluate the accuracy. So before looking at the results, let's visually look at the data. Um, so we want to see the trend between BCC versus normal and the trend between SCC versus normal. They are consistent between two data sets. And also for the extracted physiological parameters, we want to see the consistent trend between test and the training data set for different parameters. And they are comparable between two data sets. For the two data set cross-validation results, we care about the error and the RC curve on the test data set. So the 0.94 for classifying BCC versus normal and 0.9 for classifying SCC versus normal are promising. And here are the resulting RC curve on the testing data set. We also selected thresholds based on the results on the training data set. So we applied the selected thresholds on the testing data set. And these are the sensitivity and specificity we achieved. Again, this is the first study using two independent data sets to show the promise of using ERX for tumor margin assessment. And we can conclude that DRS enables tumor margin assessment. Now we have covered two problems. Let's work on problem three. The image feature engineering based model for assessing the similarity of MOS. Previous study showed the so that intrapatient assessment improves the effectiveness of melanoma diagnosis. For this figure, x-axis is different expert. The y-axis is the, um, the percentage of biopsies on the knee line. This experts used ABCD rule, the uh, ABCD rule and the ducking idea to uh, make the decisions on biopsy. So we can see that with the use of ugly doubling idea, they were able to reduce the biopsies on the device significantly. So this shows the um, so that the ugly doubling idea helps improve the um, specificity, which re reduces the unnecessary, the unnecessary biopsies on the benign device. However, no device address this issue. No study implemented this idea yet. There are lots of published studies using single image for skin lesion classification. You may know the published nature paper in 2017 that used hundreds of thousands of images to train a deep learning model for image classification. But they only used the like, lesion focused idea to analyze it. So the best they could achieve is the darker bar here. So we hope to use the ugly darkening idea to improve the accuracy of melanoma screening. 
yeah, if we have a big data set with multiple more from the same patient, we could train a neural network model as well. But it's not easy to collect clinical data sets. So as the first study, we have a small data set. Uh, our data set contains 18 patients, each of whom had at least five moles. And totally, we used 117 images. Here are some examples of the demoscopic images from our data sets. With this small data set, it's not good to train a complicated machine learning model. So I used uh, image feature engineering based model to assess the similarity of MOS. Here is the study overview. With the demoscopic image, for my model, I used the KLN to segment the lesion first, and then I did some feature engineering to calculate features related to size, color, and shape. With select the feature, I could assess the similarity of most. How I assess the similarity? I calculated the distance of each pair of moles using equilateral distance. So this is the distance in the future space. This distance can be used to assess the similarity. Closer distance me means more similar. So my model can assess the similarity. How do we evaluate it? So we need some kind of ground truth. For the first two problems, the ground truths were straightforward. They were pathology ground truths. For this one, we had to ask the methodologist to assess the similarity of MOS for us. We used a graphical user interface. We used a GUI to ask the methodologist to, to provide the similarity assessment for us. And uh, this result served as the ground truth, as the reference. To evaluate our model assessment, we compare our assessment results with the dermatologist's reference. So we can evaluate how good our model is. Here are some examples of the image processing with some features calculated and the similarity assessed. So I'm showing the segmented results for the um, crop images here. And, uh, I calculate features like size, entropy is the color variation, and the asymmetry of MOS. I used the normalized feature to calculate the distance because I want to remove the impact of the absolute value. So with the distance calculated, as I mentioned in the last slide, the closer distance means more similar. So here, D is more similar to A than, uh, than C to A. So I did, the, I did this assessment uh, for all the assessments. Um, for the similarity reference, we asked the notorious to use this GUI to select which one of these two modes is more similar to the target mode. They did totally 245 assessments, and they said it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> if one patient has four moles, we use one as the target mole, and they were asked to compare two was three, two was four, and three was four. Um, I'm showing sure one assessment example here. So if one is the target, they were comparing two was three. If our model selected two, if the components all set two, then our model agrees with all of the methodologists. Um, so for each assessment, I can see how many the methodologists agreed with our model. I counted the assessments where three the methodologists, two the methodologists, one the methodologist, and the zero the methodologists that agreed with our model. So at least two the methodologists means the majority of the three the methodologists agreed with us. For 79% of the assessments, the majority of the methodologists agreed with us. And uh, not that, when zero the methodologists or three the methodologists agreed with our model, which means they agreed with each other, um, for 62% of assessments, they agreed with each other. 
So this result shows that our model works similarly as a democratic task to assess the agreement in a more statistical way. We use place kappa, which is a agreement coefficient. Uh, it's used to evaluate the agreement among multiple raters. This, is, this table shows the interpretation of different kappa values. Note that 0.2 to 0.4 means fair agreement. 0.4 to 0.6 is moderate agreement. So here are the mean kappa value of requires independence of assessments. Remember that I used the if one patient had four more, two or three, two or four were both compared. So they are not independent. To meet the independence requirement, from each patient, for each for each iteration test, I only use the one random assessment from each patient to calculate one kappa. To make the best use of all data sets, I repeated this process for once on the times. So I got the distribution of the kappa values here. The mean kappa for three dermatologists and my model was 0.47, which is significantly higher than three dermatologists and the random guess. And it's comparable to the kappa value of three dermatologists only. So again, this shows our model can, can assess the similarity of most as dermatologists did. That's great. Uh, once we have the algorithm to assess the similarity, there are multiple applications. For example, we can use the similar idea to rank the most from the most dangerous one, having the highest probability being melanoma to the lowest dangerous one. So during the appointment with the methodologists, the methodologists can check the most dangerous ones first to improve the efficiency of the uh, appointment. Also, if we can evaluate the similarity accurately, we can evaluate the evolution of MOS over time, which is helpful for the melanoma screening. Um, in addition, if we have a database including MOS with no pathology, given a new MOS, we can use case-based reasoning to analyze the new MOS using the similarity algorithm. So there are multiple applications of this similarity algorithm for melanoma um, diagnosis problems. In terms of my contributions, for problem one, I developed, I developed a relevant statistical model to reduce the unnecessary biopsies of benign lesions for melanoma diagnosis. For problem two, I had two parts. First, I showed my model was able to uh, analyze one clinical data set and achieve similar, similar accurate plus B results as a statistical model did. And then for the second half, I applied my model for tumor margin assessment and it showed the promise of using DIS for tumor margin assessment. For problem three, I developed an uh, image feature engineering based model to assess the similarity of MOS for melanoma screening to help to help with the intra-patient assessment to find the early ducting lesions. Each part is one journal paper. The one is published to us still in annual review, and the last one we finished it. But we hope to address all the comments we received during my defense. Um, this is the list of the journal publications and the procedures, and uh, here is the conference abstract I presented during my PhD. Some pictures when I was attending conference. Last but not least, I would like to give thanks to my advisors and uh, committee members again. Also, thanks to the dermatologists from Satan Healthcare family, including my committee member, Dr. Richard who did the similarity assessment for us, and also the clinical coordinator who helped with the data collection. I would also thank my mentor for the applied statistical modeling, uh, for the applied statistical modeling portfolio, Dr. Klaus Wilke. He gave me some advice on the data analysis part. And I would give thanks to our BME staff and all the resources I have used. 
at UT to help with different aspects. And also, I enjoyed all my, like, my time with my lab members in both biomedical informatics lab and the biophotonics lab. I enjoyed my time with all of these members. Like, they are very helpful, sweet, and inspiring. And also, we had many fun events. Like, we, we went we went run together, we had many group lunch, and uh, like, we had a KTV event. Um, yeah, I had lots of fun during my PhD, and I sincerely appreciate all of your help. Thank you.
So if we look at this into our table, um, given one reflectance value, it should relate to different values for scattering and absorption coefficients. And while we extract the parameters from one spectrum, we have multiple wavelengths, right? So, um, and I don't know the answer whether it's possible or not, but the chance should be very low. Uh, yeah. That's a very good concern. Just one question. So I found this interview the ability of physiological models uh, appearing. Uh -huh. I was just curious what, what kind of inputs, what are kinds of inputs that your model can in that case? You mean the input here or where, like the input for which model? This, you, this physiological model you yeah. mentioned. Uh, the, the, the input will be the spectrum. The output will be the values for the physiological parameters. So the input will be the spectrum, which is the intensity at different wavelengths. Does this make sense? Okay, and you can map them to some... Yeah, I can map them to some uh, physiological parameters, like scattering coefficient, like oxygen saturation. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Great job. I was curious, in your experience, what's the biggest hurdle you think of getting the technology actually used in the clinic by a dermatologist? So what's the biggest uh, what? Biggest challenge. Um, yeah, I think the biggest challenge in our clinical trial is getting uh, more melanoma lesions. Like we had, uh, you know, in our data set, we had seven melanoma lesions in our total 60 lesions. It would be helpful if we have more melanoma data. Yeah, that would be one limitation of our study. I think you might be asking like, in terms of adoption, uh -huh. what do you think are hurdles the technology faces for the dermatology, for dermatologists to adopt the technology? Is that right? Yeah. Um, Put yourself in direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I may ask uh, uh, Dr. Richard about that, but I, I can provide my guess. Like, I think there are two major concerns. One is to make sure the model never miss any cancer, which is the most important thing, because missing any cancer is too dangerous. So we, want, we, we have to show first the model never misclassify any melanoma. And uh, yeah, they also prefer having some understanding of the model before accepting them. That's why um, a purely statistical model was not enough. And they tried to develop a physiological model to tell like, how our model works and why it works. So to make them accept the models easily, uh, like more easily. But that's my ideas. Do you have any? I, I think that that's a great uh, place to start. Uh, I would say that the sort of macroscopic biggest challenges is getting the FDA to approve this device would be uh, an expensive endeavor, but that's sort of the first barrier. And then if you create the device, then you, you're right. You have a second challenge. Of, okay, I have a device now. How do I convince people to use it? And there's lots of different things we can talk about from the economics of why or why they would use it to the, um, the ease of use to um, the general accepted practice and sort of becoming the standard of care. So lots of challenges to do that, not, not unsurmountable, and, and doctors have certainly adopted new technology over time, but um, uh, that would be probably the biggest things there, financial and cultural. So, in that nice structure that you're showing, what are the, um, the features from? Are those like water absorption? Um, like that top? For this PIS uh, analysis? Yeah. Um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't include the absorption of water in our model because uh, we think comparing to the absorption of 
hemoglobin and melanin absorption of water during this balance between 460, 100 something, that would be uh, next, next, much, much less. So we didn't add that in normal. Okay, so that, that's mostly hemoglobin and melanin that's causing this box. Yeah, so right now in our physiological model for the DIS analysis, the main absorption, the main absorbers are hemoglobin and melanin. So if you see the mold, the mold is like a uh, heterogeneous in color size. So like uh, if the mold is bigger and uh, what's the spots of the greater size to get the spectra? And do you take spectra one place or different place and then average it? How do you understand? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so we did consider this during our data collection. Um, so if yeah, the number of measurements on one mission depend, uh, depended on the size of the mall. Uh, we took more measurements on the bigger lesions. Uh, we didn't average the lesion because we believe there are, like, there are differences in one single lesion. And to be more conservative, we use per lesion analysis for our model, which means so for each measurement on the length for the mission, we got the probability of being melanoma for each measurement. If one measurement was predicted to be melanoma, then this lesion is melanoma. Only when all measurements are negative, this lesion is negative. So that was the um, method we used. Uh, we, for the, the other reason that we didn't average the we didn't average the multiple measurements for the length for the same lesion was that we only have one ground truth for each lesion. So it's not 100% sure that each measurement is really um, cancerous. Yeah, so that's how we handle this. Thank you. All right, so there's no more, let's think first.